Hello and welcome to Printheads. Hi guys, welcome back. Hello Mike, good to see you again, mate. Yeah, absolutely, and I understood uh, this is going to be a sticky show. You could call it that. There's been quite a lot of, lot of sticky materials, but um, we're talking about wide format materials. We'll be chatting with um, Sean Holden, who is uh, one of the honchos from Drytac, who is a major material manufacturer. Um, but also we're going to be having on uh, a, a, a second guest. So we're going to... To wow. four presenters today and we're going to be talking with Mark Mashter of Soyang Europe and um, Soyang Europe is a company that I've been familiar with for, for many years now and um, they make yeah, uh, or I they always walk you... over there I always walk over there and stuff when we go to Tsang UK yeah in the entrance way yeah. yeah you'll see yeah. the flooring yeah everything yeah. so we're talking with Mark, uh, Mark Master and there's a link up between Drytac and, and Soyang as well which is interesting because um, okay. Soyang is a UK distributor for Drytac materials so we'll get the, the story from both sides from the manufacturer so we'll get the trends in the market there, but we'll also get to, to look at the trends in the market from a reseller of the materials. And so we'll hear straight from the horse's mouth what's going on in the marketplace, particularly in this the year of COVID where, you know, at the start we knew that floor graphics just went through the roof. But I believe we're moving away from floor graphics now. So there are other applications. So why don't we bring on our, our first guest, Mike? And, um, get yeah, no, absolutely, <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I think it's it's time to, to make it a sticky show. <laughs> well, stick around, folks. Uh, boom, boom. <laughs> so we're introducing Sean Holdham. Hello, Sean. Hi, Hello, Sean. everybody. How are well, you doing? Very, very well, well indeed. Welcome to the show. All the better for seeing you. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with the print heads. Yeah. I just wanted to know which one's a thermal print head, which one's piezo, <laughs> who needs a little squeeze and who needs some heat between the pair of you. That's a bit of a picky joke there. <laughs> I'll, I'll, go for, I'll go for the squeeze. Yeah, he's, oh, right, okay. he's, <laughs> he's the main squeeze, definitely, Sean. <laughs> yeah, pleasure to be on. I hope you guys are both well. Yeah, we are indeed. Actually, we are indeed. This is um, this is going to be our, our um, final show before the Christmas break. So Jack's still away doing his um, radio Christmas, uh, which is a which actually is a lovely thing. What Jack does is he uh, every December he uh, works for a charity called Radio Christmas. It's an internet radio station, so you can catch it at uh, Radio Christmas. I think dot com, um, but they have an online presence, so you can look at. You can Google search for Radio Christmas, but it's actually um, a charity that uh, collects money for street children in you know poor, poor third world countries and so forth. So Jack does the one of the morning shows. He's actually on air as we speak. He does a, a 10 to, I think, one o'clock slot. So I had a listen the other day and it was uh, most entertaining. <laughs> Fantastic, as long as you don't do your Bob Geldof thing and we're all all right, aren't we, really? Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I've been known. I've been known. So, Sean, look, tell us a little bit about dry tech. I mean, for the uninitiated. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, as far as I'm aware, it, it comes out of Canada, I believe. Is that right? Well, it, it does come out of Canada. And ironically, the I mean, we've been in business since 1976. Um, a little bit of brief history. Our... Uh, our owner and our retired our chairman our, uh, uh, the guy that's uh, started all off is a guy called Richard Kelly who's actually an English fellow um, he was born in London um, did all his bits and pieces started in adhesives and then couldn't get really get his kind of breaks and then went over to Canada where he worked for another series of companies along the way realized that there was a lot of places that were missing and, and started up the business for himself so essentially he's an Englishman that moved to Canada and then through a series of acquisitions and uh, partnerships, he then built what, what we would call our little empire, not really anything huge, but our empire to where we are today. So we have been in business since 1976. Predominantly, we started in and around um, photographic framing, laminates and um, mounting adhesives. And that was based around our technology of optically clear adhesives for photography that had archival properties. So it was all built around that into sort of the early 90s, later 90s, where 
all of a sudden um, we had our embark on to making printable materials because obviously there was a, a requirement for self-adhesive applications of those and obviously having a techni te the technology around in our facilities to, to coat adhesives, the, the printable was the next route. Uh, we've got a facility in Bristol, um, so we're a very, very, uh, uh, very, very big, sort of, shall we say, our base is predominantly UK. We have a manufacturing facility here in Bristol, and then we've got a manufacturing in, facility in Toronto, Canada. So both sides of the pond, we actually make our products, and then we have different technologies over there either side, which we kind of swap and, swap and change around. So from humble beginnings, so they say, we've now got uh, distribution all over the world with uh, production facilities both in the UK and Canada and then our own direct um, distribution facilities throughout the whole of North America. So again you'd say started off in photographic framing mounting and laminating we've now embarked on a whole new well say whole new for the last 10 or so years into printable materials for our market that we all know and love in wide format graphics. We talk about sticky materials. I mean, is it all self-adhesive your material, or if you, what's the sort of percentage break? Our, our predominantly, we work not just in um, graphics, but we work a, 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 across a whole number of uh, different fields. But they're all self-adhesive applications. We kind of pride ourselves to say that, as Mike alluded to in the opening, we make stuff sticky. So we put on adhesives onto the back of a whole host of different substrates to make them to give them different adhesive properties from extremely permanent for industrial applications to stick um should we say beams and posts to plasterboard right the way through graphics to medical applications where we provide touch skin and sensitive adhesives for things like colostomy bags and 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 dressings and stuff like that so the although it seems quite a wide portfolio of products. They all are very, very similar that we coat a, an adhesive or a self-adhesive, depending on the application, put a release liner on it, laminate them together and make a self-adhesive product that can be in a whole host of different applications, which is quite cool, really, because not all of these little technologies do kind of overlap. You learn something in one application that then feeds itself into graphics, that then graphics then feeds itself into another application. There's all really quite, as a being involved in the development and the product portfolio, that really is quite exciting. Sean, when, when I look at adhesives and I look at, you know, coatings, and it's a crowded market. Uh, it, you know, there's a lot of people out there doing this stuff. I mean, we know a lot of the big guys, you know, the Avery's, the 3M's and, and the Hex's and then some of the other ones. And of course, Tritech and Sayong are being also uh, mentioned in that category. But the market is crowded. How do you differentiate, you know, your product compared to the other ones out there? Yeah, you're quite right. The, the market is a crowded space. And I think as a smaller manufacturer, and again, I wouldn't, uh, I'd like to, we'd obviously we're trying to grow as quick as we can and continue growing through our life but you have to work with, within your strengths and we have i'm sort of kind of proud to work the quite an incredible quite a sort of in a sort of niche development team and, and all of our guys specialize in different side of areas and we we kind of work around niche products so specialist application easy apply easy remove no residue so as opposed to running through um, miles and miles of monomeric or polymeric films were just permanent or removable. We also like to adapt. So we kind of listen to the market in a way and see where the trends are going and see that people need to install teams are incredibly extensive, to, uh, expensive to, mm -hmm. um, to send around countries. So you need to have products that can be installed by people in a store. In a, in a facility that needs to put a sign up and they need to be removed that doesn't require heavy duty cleaning afterwards to take the glue off. So outside of just putting glue on the back, it's the, the thought of the application, I think, that makes us slightly different to the rest of it. And again, having our history born into optical clear, optically clear adhesives and archival adhesives, then that kind of technology lends itself more and more to graphics as those machines have developed into printing on a whole host of different substrate. They've got white. So you can do amazing things now. So having a wide portfolio of different adhesives, I think kind of gives us a little bit of a, a differentiator between us and maybe some of the larger manufacturers around the world. Well, Sure. No, I mean, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> go, ahead, go, go, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Mike. I was just, you know, I was just thinking about yesterday. Yesterday we had the, the EDP Awards and one of the prize winners of the EDP Award was an antibacterial coating 
uh, which is toner based for uh, you know the Kodak machines, but you know the next press is the big digital prints. But antibacterial, the front side coating. I, I, I remember the old days when we used to put a very thin laminate on top of photographs to to protect the photographic image for you know UV lighting and and, and, and you know wet waste you know all kinds of stuff scratch resistance, but antibacterialization of of media uh, is a front side you know it's not a back side uh, do you guys adapt yourselves to that technology and, and and those questions because i can imagine there is a lot of questions for that yeah well that's obviously the question after floor graphics the question of the question of the day is what have you got uh, in antibacterial products and and we've done a lot of work in actual fact we've had a product that's anti antimicrobial now for is there anything in the background? Is this the elf? Yeah, somebody's <laughs> printing. But uh, yeah. they, you, know, you, you start talking about adhesives, antibacterials, and other things, and you start printing. printing. But uh, no, I, I, I'm going to come up with... Do you know what I said before the show about Mike's dog barked? Okay, I'm sat next to my printer. I've got my kid at home from university. She's wandering around in the background, and she's remote printing while we're broadcasting. So I'm sorry about that. Sorry to, to blow your thread. It's the, this is family life. Say hello, Poppy. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, it, so tells, it, it tells you a little bit of working from home and uh, in, in the COVID times. Uh, I can guarantee you that soon oh, God. it'll be all over. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a crappy true. HP one as well, but yeah, let's not know. let's not go into it. Yeah, it's yeah, oh. so coming back to sort of antimicrobial coatings. That we've we've had a product in the in our portfolio for many years that's antimicrobial, and again over the last six or seven months, there's the requirements have completely changed, um, and I think a lot of people are kind of working into this uh, in space because it's going to be an yes. environment that's going to grow at great pace. Um, we have um, an embedded additive within a polyester film that we've got that we're selling as an antimicrobial film. Um, we've done a lot of work behind the scenes to put a diesel on the back that's to be applied in all kinds of surfaces. And that's not just the laminate now, that's a surface protection film and can be used in all kinds of environments. That, um, And again, I think it's an understanding point. The, the, the area around antimicrobial films is one that's heavily dominated by marketing, but the marketing isn't actually cor correct or legal. So we're kind of fighting amongst people that say, say one thing when it actually is another. I mean, if I give you one sort of... Uh, idea around that. I mean, a lot of people claim that their product has um, can protect against coronavirus. Well, coronavirus is sort of seven or eight, nine, ten strains, and only one of those is COVID-19. So it's like saying, I've had my flu jab yesterday, and I'm okay to go to the general population because I'm not going to get COVID-19. There's all these false claims that are coming around the market. And again, it's about making our, our the general population, the public, understand what these films can do. And ours are all antimicrobial, which means they protect against algae, um, fungus and bacteria. And we also have selected strains of viruses that it works against. But understanding the difference between a, a bacteria and a, a virus is understand how they work as well, because viruses will naturally die outside of a human host, whereas a bacteria and an algae and a fungus will live on a surface and replicate on a surface. So we've been working very, very hard to promote our products. We're doing a lot of um, information that's going out. We're, we're looking at we're introducing a range of consumer based products because that is a market that we've identified for. I don't think it's just going to be short term. I think for now we've identified that there is a requirement for hygiene and cleanliness in spaces. And I think that's going to continue. So our development on things like touch screens and, uh, and um, surface protections is something at the oh, forefront yeah. of the next year. No, absolutely. I think it's, you know, you're very right when you, when you talk about antibacterial and antiviral, uh, you know, having the differentiator because antibacterial is, is something you can do something about. Um, and antiviral, it, like you said, it, it really depends on the virus and, and what type of, you know, little animal there is. One of the things I see, uh, you know, as a, as a huge potential for this market that has, in my opinion, not really been touched right now, are menu cards, restaurant menu cards, you know, where uh, there's a lot of touching between people uh, in a very short period of time. 
where this could be an amazing solution. Uh, uh, handrails uh, and buttons on elevators. Uh, you know, there's, I think there is a, a huge potential for that type of material coming on board. And I think you're right. In five years from now, we will probably all say that is standard. You know, uh, so things have changed because of COVID. But I, I also realize that um, you know we have to be realistic and, and see that we need to do step by step. Uh, and this is uh, quite important. When when I talk materials again, um, most of the materials that we're familiar with when I come to dry tech, uh, and, and that's what I and it's my my short vision on this one to be honest, is large format printing. But I presume that dry tech outside of the you know where they came from photographic imaging, um, there must be all kinds of stuff in the past that has been brought back to the future and and and, and comes to that so. Any 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 trends in in, in 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 this business right now, Sean? Yeah, I think our trends. Obviously, we all had that explosion earlier in the year in floor graphics. It gave us a massive education um, in that part of that period in terms of understanding slip ratings throughout Europe. Again, it's one of those things that the graphics community jump on board very quickly, and, and understanding those certifications are very different. Um, we've worked very tirelessly. We now do our own slip certification in house. Um, we've registered to be do ink British standard for um, pendulum testing in house. Uh, in addition, obviously, there's been a huge explosion in short term graphics. So, obviously, with short term and temporary signage everywhere, people are looking, as I intimated earlier on, that in, into graphics that can be applied by anyone into into spaces to give either directional wayfinding or um sort of uh, health explanations that need to be up for the short term so that's kind of where our, some of our adhesive technologies such as our spot on adhesive which is um where we print adhesive dots on the reverse of a film that allows it to be put up very very easily and then remove any bubbles also our other technologies such as our retac adhesive technology which is our permanently peelable adhesive it works a bit like a post-it note if you i'm sure everybody's uh, had experience using a post-it note you take it off you stick it you pull it off you put it somewhere else that adhesive technology was we've, we've engineered onto the back of a, um to films for graphic applications so you can put uh, again short-term temporary signage or even long-term wall coverings up with that adhesive application so all of these things we've seen a huge explosion um, in the requirement for those graphics, specifically mm. around short term. And then on the other side of it, because people are at home, it sort of led them more and more into wall coverings and those requirements. Because you're at home, you're kind of looking at your four walls every day, If you're, especially as we've all been experienced the lockdown earlier in the year. And people want to put different stuff on the wall that uh, that is custom to them or personal to them. So all of these markets outside of what is... Um, uh, as what we traditionally know in event graphics and we've uh, in, in signage is all kind of taken a little sidestep and people have had to get creative to keep their businesses running the requirements for making places covid secure and having signage in the right place and and again we've also learned that a human being can be directed around a, a, um, an environment such as a, a store with signage and floor graphics so it's all about the invention of how to make though that that signage those messages either marketing based or consumer based so uh, it's it's really exciting at the moment i know there's been a lot of turmoil in our industry which is and the events has caused a lot of people to be out of work which is really really terrible but again it's also sometimes you need a little bit of a reset to start having a little bit of a think about what you can do with this amazing equipment that's been developed over the last 10 15 years yeah i mean one of the things we've been talking about in this show a couple of times already is you need to be inventive you need to be innovative you need to change the vision of your company uh, if you want to survive uh, these times these are changing times and changing times require differences one of the things like you said is is wallpaper um you know we we see uh, a general trend uh, in, in wallpaper uh, changing the market a little bit more uh, i can imagine that will stay and, and continue to be uh, you know the world um and the other side, large format printing, uh, I know it, it sounds harsh to say, and it's not very nice, but it was oversaturated. Yeah. And uh, when you have oversaturation and everybody's trying to sell into the same product in the same shop, in the same customer, uh, it's going to be a trouble. And uh, that makes it, you know, a little bit complicated. But I understood, Colin, we have somebody else hanging around somewhere in the mm, dark. We do. we do indeed, actually. We have... Uh, uh, um, 
Well, somebody that's well known to Sean, who's um, a, a, a UK distributor of dry check materials. Uh, oh, among... so we can, we can ask him if he sells the stuff. Absolutely. Oh, cool. uh, 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 <laughs> whether or not. Well, I was going to say, we, we need to find out whether the stuff's any good or not. You know, because um, he wouldn't sell it if it wasn't, in my opinion. So let me uh, bring on our next guest, which is uh, Mark Master, who's the managing director of Soyang Europe. So, uh, hello, Mark. There you are in the bottom right Good there. Good to see you. Thanks Forget for joining us. Yeah, lovely. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for joining. Hey, great to speak to you guys. You're all looking very well. Uh, thanks very much. Now, Mark, you've been. Um, developing your business over a, a well quite a number of years now i've known you personally for you know well over about 15 years i think so um tell us a little bit about soyang europe and how it, how that really started and where you are today because it, it's quite quite a success story in my opinion yes um we've we've been in existence now for 16 years um and we came from very very humble beginnings um, where there was literally three of us that started the business. Um, my background has always been in PVC manufacturing, and I had the chance to uh, team up with uh, Soyang Technologies China, um, going back 16, 17 years ago. So Soyang did have a distributor uh, in, in the UK, uh, somebody that I did work for previously, but uh, very much wanted me to front their European operation uh, and become their European operations director. But instead of doing that, we decided to open a warehouse and distribution centre uh, around the Manchester area. Um, so initially just taking in two containers of PVC banner. And that was, that was how the business started. So from 16 years ago to, to now, we, we employ 20 people. Um, we have a warehouse facility in Lancashire where we have about 70,000 square foot. So that's six and a half thousand square meters of warehousing with approximately 1.5 million square meters of stock. So we're supporting the UK printers very, very well with inventory um, to make next day deliveries. Sorry about that. That's all right. Oh, We've had my printer. Yeah, that's that's the first, you know, I mean, this Mark's really dog's works, gone. Right? It's the first order right in, you know. Yeah, right in. So yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah. Mark's I mean, dog's with that gone. that many square meters, you're basically covering the UK, so that's fine. <laughs> but we're trying our best. Um, and it's, it is very much a log logistical challenge. Um, it, it has to be said. Um, because I would say a high percentage of the product that we sell is coming out of our own production in China. So I would say in the region of 65 to 70 percent of what we sell is coming from our own production. Uh, and then we've got some strategic partners like DryTac um, and people like Engitex and Semfer and, and, and various others, which complement what we produce ourselves. And we also offer a, a great service to the customers by having those materials as well. So... Mark, how have you found the market really during this period of time? Because we are living in a very strange time, you know. There's no doubt about that. It's mental. But how has it been for you? Um, it, it's been challenging. Um, you know, I think we've I think we've done reasonably well um, in terms of the levels of, of, of turnover that we've enjoyed this year. Um, not you know we're not hitting budget but you know we're certainly not in the red and we've we've seen we've seen some customers become quite entrepreneurial producing all types of things that they didn't used to produce um you know things like face masks you know dye sublimation printers going into the production of face masks um people making acrylic screens you know all kinds of diversification using their equipment to do other things. Um, I would say that the hardest time this year was, was probably uh, probably April, May time, uh, when, when everybody's business really fell off the edge of a cliff in, in April. But it bounced back unbelievably in, in May with, uh, with floor graphic materials. Um, 
but the but the biggest losers you know in the industry i think at the moment have really been the people in the exhibition industry mm. and the the outdoor event industry where there's literally no no exhibitions no events so no printing it's yeah. it's been a disaster area so we've we've had to diversify um you know this this year we've gone into into sheet product which is something that this company's never done yeah. um so we found we've found found some very good partners who have factories very close to our own factory so we can consolidate their materials into the containers that are already coming across so this year we've developed uh, relationships for for acrylic sheet so we've done a lot of cre clear acrylic for for, for yeah, all these, uh, these screens um, and from, by the beginning of next year we'll be very much involved in the aluminium composite panel business um, because as a as a distributor with its own transport we can we can service the customers that we've already got and add product on to what we sell to them what what's significant um, about that material mark about the aluminium composite yeah um it, it's it's a, it's a material that customers are already buying it's a right. material customers are using a lot of um we've got a very very good very very good supplier out in asia um who are producing for other people selling uh, acp um the Aluminium composite business has done quite well because you you know that the amount of house building that's that's going on at, at the moment around every side is a digitally printed panel, yeah, or yeah, numerous panels. So you know we have a set of customers who are quite keen for us to to be part of their supply chain on that because yeah. they enjoy good service on the other products that that we sell to them. Let me ask you about um, uh, building wraps. That was always something that, that I remember, but you know, a few years ago, you were very heavily into. I don't know whether or not I've got complacent or not, but I'm not noticing uh, building wraps and, and these things being used in the same way. Was that a, a, a flash in the pan, that market, or is that still significant? Have we just got used to seeing building wraps? volumes of, of mesh being printed it's, yeah. it's not always just for building wraps though. right uh, a lot of that is, is banner or mesh being used for that uh, so the volumes of that are quite high and a lot of the food retailers and the clothing retailers are, uh, are printing onto these big easily fitted mesh banners on the side of vehicles um, you know so the volumes are great um, building wrap yes isn't as big as it used to be and i think grenfell probably had quite a lot to do with that wow. um, because the, the the insurance companies are asking for very high specification flame retardant materials now um and to get to the specifications it's it's extremely difficult with with a pvc um it has to be said you know you could use something like fiberglass but it's enormously expensive yeah and difficult to print and fabricate but yeah. uh i mean but, but there I, are I there are still that is true no i do know that's true and and mark uh you know if you look at polyester mesh is one of the things that is is taking over that because they can put trevier in which basically uses the fire retardancy. Uh, the big difference here is, of course, the side where I'm sitting on, the other side of the pond, or the little channel, if let's put it that way, is that the regulations in Germany, France, Spain, UK, et cetera, et cetera, they're all different. And that makes it very complicated for, you know, making all the materials go. Because if I look at Soyang, and I don't want to be bad in this one, but I don't see it in Europe as much as I see it in the UK. In the UK is, is very predominant. Um, but here, uh, how, how are you doing in continental Europe? And what are your expectations in, I think, 22 days from now? We are in Europe and we, we sell a lot of material into Europe. People are OEMing uh, the material. So you won't particularly see the Soyang brand. So we have a, a select group of distributors um, and Soyang Europe actually um, 
does have a joint venture in Belgium uh, with a small distributor there. We, we, we own some shares in a business there. Um, going back now, I would say two and a half, three years. And that's proved to be quite successful. Um, so, you know, we, we have warehousing um in europe right on the the french belgium uh, german border which is which is particularly good for, for logistics uh, and our office is just outside brussels so right. with a with a little company called beltex um which 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 we you know got involved with two or three years ago what, what do you expect brexit to change for you guys because i presume uh, that is an issue that you've been discussing for the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've already had customers, you know, asking us about about that type of thing. And, and that's why we why we made our investment in Beltex, um, you know, because because exporting will become more and more difficult. Um, interesting in terms of, of importation from 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 the likes of Germany and and, and Portugal, where our other partners are, um, you know what we what we're doing at the moment is making provision uh, like like we have to every year with with our European partners. We make provision in all for August because they all shut down for a month. Yeah. So what we're doing at the moment is making provision for the beginning of next year, so that we don't have any interruption. Mm-hmm. So you know our, our inventory levels will will rise by maybe half a million pounds um, if, in the next couple of months because because we've got to get in front of the game and yeah. we don't want to let customers down. Well, Mark, let, let me ask you a question. We talked we talked about um, you know the market and the trends and what's going on, and, and and you mentioned that floor graphics kind of went through the roof at the start of the whole kind of COVID uh, nightmare. What what? trends are you seeing your customers wanting now what are they looking for from you i think all our customers you know, they made massive investment in 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 machines uh, for printing and cutting and fabricating and they need to find materials that will give them added value so like mike was saying before uh, home decor and, right. and and wall covering and things like that um adds value um fitting out offices with wall covering um we do a, we do a lot of seamless wall covering i know sean is 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 large format but we do a lot to the grand format market all the way up to five meters wide um and we've definitely seen a, you know a massive trend towards seamless wall covering um predominantly using canvas type materials with a with an acrylic coating um, but one of the developments that we're just doing at the moment is to produce a wall covering that is is to be printed dye sublimation because dye sublimation is odorless. Colours are absolutely fantastic. And pretty much all the grand format printers making investment have gone towards dye sublimation and they want to use that investment. And you, you can actually fold it and, and or roll it and it's... You know, dye sub is, is a fantastic uh, print method. Uh, and we, 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 you know, all our investments in the last two or three years, uh, Colin, have been towards coating textile. You know, PVC, we have three, three coating lines. And textile this year, we will have four coating lines. Right. So going all the way up to five meters wide. So textile really did take off for you, didn't it, in the marketplace? Yeah. You know, because re- retail have embraced it very much. Yeah. Obviously, with things like light boxes and display polyesters, and then the exhibition industry, um, pretty much everything is has moved towards black back textile and light box material. Um, and as as a company, we are vertically integrated to produce those products. So at the, at the factory, we, um, you know, we we're, we're beaming yarns. Uh, we're knitting and weaving textile, we're washing in-house, and we're coating. Nice. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't become any more vertical than that, really. Mm. Um, so that gives us a very competitive edge. Absolutely, and I can imagine uh, you guys, uh, you know, moving away from PVC as, you know, PVC has so many disadvantages, environmentally disadvantages, that, you know, textile is 
uh, a great solution. Uh, most of the textiles, of, most of the polyesters are, are very good recyclable. And we see some new textiles coming in that are, you know, giving you the same properties as, as polyesters, but giving you the full recyclability. Talking about that, uh, Sean, what do you see in textiles at DryTech? I mean, if, if you're seeing the growth there, is this an opportunity for you guys to grab or? Well, generally with, with test textiles, the, the, the limitation is how, what, what, what adhesive can you put on the back? It's something that we've kind of been investigating for a while and, uh, and up till, to say recently, it's something we haven't looked at, but it's certainly in our, our, our plan to look at look at uh, fabrics and textiles that we can, uh, that can adhesive coat to give that uh, a different application. Uh, you touched on there about PVC free. Now, PVC free is obviously going to be front and center over the next next while, next little while. It was before, but then unfortunately the world changed this year that kind of had to put a slant on things. So certainly looking for replacement PVCs, obviously around polyester, around polypropylene. We're also looking at uh, starched based starch based films that are biodegradable. But all of these are kind of we all have a lead to this environmental challenge, but the biggest thing that for us in terms of sustainability is the release liner. The release liner of, we all talk about the face film of the product um, and we talk about how sustainable that has to be, but every kind of forgets that on the back of every self-adhesive product is a release liner. You think about plasters, how many plasters are sold in the world? And, the, and you have a plaster that's fabric on the front and it's all very good for you, but on the back, you've got two tiny pieces of release liner that at the moment really are difficult to, re to to recycle or make sustainable so these are the challenges within our environment and we're certainly working with our paper manufacturers to to develop sustainable release liners because we see that as one of our sort of holes in in giving our sustainable products we can work with starch based films that are all recyclable that are biodegradable but then um it's all about the ink or so you put on the top. So although there's lots and lots of technologies out there that claim to be sustainable, as soon as you actually apply as a process, and actually ironically, myself and Mark have worked on projects over the last year to 18 months because they have a recycling program with PVC banner and doing actually integrating PVC uh, PVC vinyl that has adhesive back onto making that recyclable. But again, the challenge on those products is the fact that you've got an adhesive on the rear and, and unfortunately, it's understanding what adhesive you have on the back and whether you can take that off before that physical PVC is recycled. So there's a whole lot of challenges in the sustainability thing that come outside of just actually choosing a face film that's recyclable. This is something I wanted to ask Mark about, actually, Sean, because, um, Mark, uh, I, funnily enough, I was only talking with Marie Harley the other day. And, um, Very good. I understand that, that you, at Soyang, actually, you know, have a, have a partnership with uh, a company called Blue Castle for uh, PVC recycling. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it was something that, uh, that that we set up now, uh, I would say, a couple of years ago with Blue Castle. And, and you know, we instigated them getting involved in recovering um, PVC banner uh, and mesh materials and trying to turn it into into another product so we have a partnership with blue castle that's right um we take them to see let's say some of the premiership printers in the in the uk um who were involved with big retail chains food chains exhibition that type of thing and you know offer a service where the pvc scrap is taken away or PVC is recovered after after the end of its life. Um, so taken out of billboards, that type of thing. Uh, and it comes back to uh, a factory um, in Nottinghamshire, which is where Blue Castle are based. And it's granulated and chipped and it's turned into second grade molded products. Mm. So it's things like street furniture, road cones, bases for Harris fencing, all types of things. So at least it gets a second life. Yeah, um, they're one of the few people who can do it. Mm. Yeah. It's not going to landfill because landfill isn't sustainable. We don't want to be digging any more holes no. in the ground and shoving rubbish in it. Yeah. So, you know, the best thing that we can do is recycle products. Um, mm. You know, and in terms of non-PVC materials, 
um, you know, they can also be recycled as well. And and we as a company are working on alternatives to to PVC banner because we have the technology to do it. Um, it's just getting the timing right. Um, so we, we're in that development stage at the moment. Um, first production of non-PVC banner is taking place now. Right. Um, and, and we will more than likely be um, where the stock lands in, in Europe. So, you know, that's something that we've been working on all this year to try and get it right. Because there's many factors. You know, everybody, although they're asking for non-PVC product, there's always a trade-off with a non-PVC material at the moment. A, does it print very well? Because sometimes with, with some of the materials, mm -hmm. you've got to uh, corona treat them to get, to get ink adhesion. B, will it, will it, will it fold? It, will, it, will it be as soft and supple as PVC? And can you fabricate it? Mm. Because the biggest problems are, can you, can you heat weld it? Can you HF weld it? And, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. There's always seems to be a bit of a trade-off. And, you know, the holy grail of, of a non-PVC banner is to produce something that's non-PVC that behaves like PVC. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very difficult. And costs the same because I think one of the, the bigger factors uh, for the PVC biggest problem is, is everything's cost. double or treble. Yeah. 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 Price is it's one of the, the biggest chicken, issues. It's a chicken and egg situation. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's like uh, we, we produce textile from recycled yarns, but recycled yarns and more and recycled yarn from PET bottle is more is more expensive than virgin yarn. Yep. People want it. Yeah, no, I mean, but they want to yeah, pay for it. Uh, well, that's it's that's what the thing. story. Although, yeah, although, although I do believe that uh, the the world you know, is impacting. I mean, we are the older generation when we, we put it this way. Uh, if I look at my kids and I look at their generation, uh, you know, uh, beat the plastic microbeads is is a big drive right now to get plastic out of our oceans to 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 look at you know these microplastics being everywhere. So I, I do believe that it's good to start looking at new products and uh, people should really be aware of their environment and not only cost. Uh, one of the things I, I always remember on trade shows in the, the days that I was working for manufacturers is people would come up to me, how much is one liter ink? Well, you know, when somebody came up like that to me, I would say a thousand pounds. They would say, well, very, very expensive. I say, yeah, I know it's very expensive, but you're asking the wrong question. The question is, how much do you need to use to get a square meter printed? And this is where we see the same with, with PVC banner changing over to different type of materials is it's not the cost of, of the, the square meter of PVC or non-PVC material. It's the cost of the total project. You know, how much do you print it for and how much do you sell it for? And what is your margin? And, and I think we, in our industry, we've been looking so much at always looking at the buying price of our products that we haven't looked at what is the, the end result of our products. You know, well, if I can print a banner on a different type of material that costs 50% more, but I have 70% less waste, I'm making money. This is a calculation that people in our industry, especially in the sign industry, are not making. Uh, the big guys are, the, you know, the sim presses of the world. They're making those calculations daily. But the small mom and pop shops should realize that buying a brand, buying a product that is tested, buying a product that is there, maybe environmentally sound, is going to save them money instead of costing them money. And this is a, a big issue that I think we all in our industry should, uh, should start looking onto. Um, I want to come back to Europe for a sec, as, as I'm the only uh, soon to be European in this product, in this project. Um, Sean Drytech, uh, Europe. I mean, uh, big market. Uh, yes. I, your brand is, is well recognized uh, in, in across Europe. How are you feeling, uh, the European? Is there's a lot of differences this year when it comes to, to selling Drytech into the different countries? Uh, I mean, we're feeling confident. I think we've got um, some good traction now. We're, we're recognized, as you say. Um, we're recognised for the right reasons, which is nice. Um, we're confident, but slightly nervous. Uh, the slightly nervous, I think, is is the same for everyone, is because not only we produce in the UK, but that doesn't mean to say that we don't source some of the raw materials that require we require from Europe. 
So we've got to import stuff, then re-export stuff into Europe, which is going to have its challenges. Um, like like Mark said, we've invested in the infrastructure, we've invested in stock, we've inve- we've sort of trying to do what we can based on what we know. Uh, I don't want to get political, but the obviously the problem we, we're all facing is that the 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 information coming from our government and the stuff within the EU government isn't clear. So there's no clear path that actually anybody knows right now or what's going to happen. So although we're confident, although we're we're quite buoyant in terms of what we can produce and our customers aren't going to go away we we might have to take we might have to think slightly outside the box to get things to people and and maybe reach a change the way we do it but we've got a number of a little bit like our uh, in terms of our covid vaccine plan we've got four or five options to see how it plans pans out in january and february hopefully plan a works uh, and we carry on and the, the we get a deal and we can export and import quite easily. Failing that, then um, we've got other options in terms of we have customers that have all ordered extra stock. We've put a lot of in, uh, stuff in place in Europe, giving people extra terms and stuff to make sure that the the supply chain is managed for the first part. And then, unfortunately, as with the rest of us, we'll, we're kind of in the hands of hands of our, our, our politicians and the European politicians to work something out, unfortunately. Yeah, then yeah, that's never going to happen, is it? At this rate, we all know about politicians. You vote yeah. for them because they promise us something, and then once they get elected, they say, "Did I say that? Yeah. Did I? Did absolutely. I say that?" That's an issue. Yeah, so, absolutely. You know, it's, it's one of those things. But uh, luckily, that is the same for everybody. So it doesn't matter if you're in India or if you're in Korea watching this show, uh, guys. They're yeah. all the same. And so that's a, it, it's, it's a type of the breed. Now, I, I want to come back again to, to some of the material uh, questions uh, as, as I, I have the chance of you having, you know, having you both here. Um, you were talking, Mark, about acrylics, uh, sheet materials and bringing that into the market. Uh, I, I think you're right. Uh, you know, there is a huge demand right now. But the word is right now. That scares me a little well, bit. I mean, absolutely, absolutely, it is. It is right now. And you know, all we did was take uh, an opportunity uh, because we have a neighbouring factory out in China producing acrylic sheets, and because the demand was so high, um, you know, the let's say the local manufacturers, the European manufacturers, couldn't cope with the demand, and there was mm. a there was a window of, of opportunity for us to you know, have a level of turnover that, that, that we probably needed. So, we, you know, we, we invested uh, in, in, in four or five 40 foot high cube container loads of acrylic sheet, of which there's half a container left. So it, it's gone out into the market and then um, went very, very well. But it's given us, it's given us the confidence to diversify as a company to go into more sheet product, as I said, with aluminium composite. But you know, our key focus will always be on, on roll goods, uh, materials that we produce ourselves and, and things that complement uh, what we produce ourselves. So I, I do it, I, I do believe, Mark, that if you look at uh, sheet materials, uh, I think people are making the biggest mistakes in the sheet business, uh, at least in my opinion, um, is they want to sell everything. Uh, I have 50 different opaque uh, colored acrylic. I have that in 17 different sizes. I can cut it for you and ship it out within 24 hours. Uh, I can, I can't, I can't, I can't. But the reality is it, it doesn't make money that way. And my opinion is if you bring it back to a three millimeter composite, a four millimeter composite done in color white, preferably digital printable, uh, if you look at acrylics, um, white, transparent, and black, and all the other stuff, print it. I think you can make money, uh, and there is there is a sustainable you move the business. Stock. And you because can move, you move the stock. And that is, I mean, I, I know you know some of these polyester companies or, or acrylic companies, and I look at their warehouses, and wow, they are impressive. I have to say, they are impressive. You know, these sheets of two forty four by one twenty two, or even bigger sheets, impressive. Then I ask, how long have they been laying there? Because that really opaque green translucent, um, <laughs> you know, who's using it? And they, they said, well, wait, wait, three years ago, uh, we sold it to the military. Okay, and that's why they abolished it. Um, overstocking is a huge problem. Um, 
I can imagine, you know, if you, if, if you look at Sean's materials, adhesives, they don't stay there forever, uh, Sean. Uh, no, they don't. You know, they they, they, they kind of die out. Good. I mean, I got some sticky paper that I found in my cabinet and there, there were labels. I mean, it's paper for laser, so it's nothing to do with our industry. But I, I, I took it, took the release liner off, slapped it on where I wanted to slap it on, and it fell off. Absolutely. What do we do about that? I think the biggest problem is that's an, uh, again our market is very very good at reaction and the understanding level needs to be a little bit more of an education point because all removable adhesives over a period of time go permanent so you're either going to deal with an adhesive that's already no, or, gone or non-permanent by the way yeah. Yeah. Or non they're going to be they're going to be removable by gravity as we say in our industry or if you actually have applied it and you've not removed it in the period that it needs to be removed it will go permanent and it will be a jolly tough one to get yeah. off so that's that's kind of where uh, again that education point comes down and 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 i think you you summed it up earlier mike in terms of understanding the application it might involve buying a slightly more expensive product that doesn't need a team of fitters to put it up and doesn't need the, a team of fitters to remove it and then take it down i'll, I'll give you a quick a synopsis we work with a, a a chain of um a chain of stores that uh, are very very low grade low grade um clothes within the UK um, they wanted window graphics and they've been doing lots and lots of stuff with window graphics for years this uh, this company and they've been spending thousands on pounds of replacing windows because when they, when they were taking their existing window graphics off it was scratching the windows they changed to our spot on on the windows and they're up and down they don't need professional fitters and although the material is twice the price they've saved over Two hundred thousand pounds a year on a not scratching the graph and the glass and b a team of, of window fitters so those people can be very happy so again it's and again it's all about understanding the application thinking out of it logically and I think the specifiers have a big problem to pay in this because all they're looking at is square meter cost they don't look at any added costs of of terms of application installation and removal because all of these have an added factor and they should be incorporated into should we say the fitted and finished square meter cost and that's a i think a lot of things for um our, our industry to educate itself on is actually what is the true cost because then finally you've got the cost of removing it and putting it in landfill or recycling it and all these things have to be taken into account when you're deciding what to use for a product but i don't think many people do that right now no i think i think you're right and education uh, i mean in in this very fast moving industry we're in i mean if you look at signage uh, 20 years ago, and I'm, you know, what is 20 years in a lifetime? Uh, it has changed dramatically, you know, totally. Uh, but education wise, uh, it, it, it's soft. I mean, to get a good sign education in, in countries, they're almost not findable. Uh, there's some countries in Germany, I think Germany still has some sign education, and but it's, it's really minimal. Um, when we look at educating our own customers, uh, we try to do it on trade shows. But the word try is, is where mm. I, I struggle with because we don't do enough. Um, and I think education is something which is, is crucial when it comes to uh, something I call the circular cost to cost, uh, mm. where the product, you know, from out unboxing the product till reboxing the product, if you put it that way. So what is the total cost of ownership? That's a lovely one to come up with, Mike, because it leads me perfectly into talking about on the 15th of December, I shall be co-hosting a silent digital online event where we're talking textiles. And I'll be interviewing uh, several people, one of which is Magnus Mihal of RA Smart in the UK, okay. who I, uh, I firmly believe is, is one of the leading experts in, in printed textiles. So we're going to be focusing on that. And, and when you say, you know, try, it is what, what we do. We, we are trying to share education. What Printheads is doing is to share Absolutely. knowledge and share information and provide a platform for people to come on and talk freely and openly uh, and, and really sort of discuss sort of issues and what's going on. And it, it really leads me to thank you guys for coming, Sean and, and Mark, and for agreeing to come on and gives us the opportunity to stretch our technology a little bit better with this four-way communication, which I think is great. Um, I did actually say to a designer, a friend of mine who makes all my overlays for the show, and uh, I said, can you run to a five or a six? And he was like, <laughs> it'll look like the Brady Bunch, and I'm not sure you want to do that. So I, I think we'll stick to a four for, for future shows. 
But it's been great having you on. It's been great chatting to you. And thank you, Mark, for, for sharing really your insights in the market with us. You know, it's, it's really useful. And it'll be useful for any printer that's watching this now to start thinking about what they might want to be doing next year because things are going to change, aren't they? You know, things are going to take off. Sooner as this, this, this restrictions get lifted from our lives, then we need to get back to work. Uh, printers need to really start going and seeing people. That's when the, when, when, when the market's going to uplift, is when people can sit down with their customers and actually say, well, have you thought about this? Have you looked at that? This is what's new. This has been developed over the last year or so, year, 18 months. Mark, what about from you as a sort of closing statement on projections and where you think you, your business will will really go next within the next two years, let's say? I think we're we're in an extremely strong position, actually. Um, you, you know, Sean knows our business. He he knows how we operate and the investments that we make. Um, so we're we're very geared to all these 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 new materials that are coming up. So there's some quite exciting things going to happen next year from us, um, especially, especially as we go bigger and wider with, with, with machines uh, and bring everything in-house into our own production. Um, so, yeah, we're in a strong position. Um, you know, for clients, we've, we've, taken, we've taken a lot of time in developing new sample books to try and educate customers as to exactly everything that we've got and how it can be used. Um, and, and with our partners like DryTag, uh, I think they've done a tremendous job this year, you know, educating the industry uh, in terms of all the things like slip ratings and flame retardances and, and antibacterial, which is taking customers into new areas uh, and, and trying to add value to product. Um, because like I said previously, you know, we have customers spending millions of pounds on, on printing machines. They don't want to print stuff for nothing. Mm. You know, they've got to find that added value. And, you know, one of the great products that we've had over the last four or five years has been the, the G Floor product, the build product from America. And, and when, we, when we talk to customers about that, and, and that's for, you know, that goes into museums, it goes into retail, all kinds of applications. We get them to think about commercial flooring. Don't think about digital printing. Think yeah. about flooring. Commercial flooring, bespoke flooring, is fitted for 160 pounds a square metre. Mm, mm. So that's that's massive money for printers. Yeah. yeah. So they, they've got to think outside that digital printing box, haven't they? Yeah. They've got to be more entrepreneurial about the business and where they take it. So, we, you know, we've got some great customers who, who make good revenue and good profit from doing some quite niche things. Um, you know, and getting out of the comfort zone. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to ask Sean about slip ratings because he could talk for the next half hour about that without a break. Yeah. So, but Sean, t tell us a little bit about actually dry tech in terms of a closing thing. What, what what have you got coming up? What's going to be uh, wetting the appetite of the viewer? I mean, I think well, I think what well, everybody's we've, we've talked about is about adding value and, and looking at different market sectors to 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 a sort of explore that not necessarily just putting the print on a graphic and then putting the laminate on the top. Again, adding value, thinking outside the box. We're going to do a lot of work in sustainability, making the products recyclable but in the right right way, or biodegradable but in the right way. Um, as I said, we've we've invested heavily into our antimicrobial technologies. That, I believe, is something we're going to take forward and it will be into a whole host of areas outside of just the printing community. And we've already seen that 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 take off right now. So it's developing those for all kinds of different applications whilst, again, educating the educating the industry. I think one of the things we have to do is share the technology we have, not just encase it and not tell anybody what we can do. Share our share our knowledge base, share what we're trying to do, work with people like Mark that are visionaries and trying to get that information not just to the print community but to their customers i like to think that we as manufacturers have to educate the people that are the actual end user and that's not the guy with a with a printer that's the guy that's going to be specifying it for his store or his head his healthcare facility or whatever or even the lady working for it into into a shop or whatever we have to educate those guys so those guys have the knowledge 
to ask them for the right product to their print customers, their print, uh, their print partners. And that's what I believe we, we all need to do as a community. We need to educate and educate the whole, the whole spectrum of our, 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 uh, of our clients and that not just being the printers. And again, we've, we've got some firm commitment to, to, to improve what we're doing in terms of minimizing our waste and all that kind of good stuff to be better for the environment. And alongside bring a whole host of new products into the fore that we do answer some questions and some requirements that are needed by the market. Well, thanks very much, guys. Thanks for being with us today. We really appreciate it. So, Mike, there we go. That's that's Uh, our show. It's time to do the the right thing. So, there we go. It's Christmas time. Absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, Christmas. So we are really, um, you know, looking at, at what we're going to be doing at Christmas time, which for us isn't isn't anything. We're taking a break until uh, the start of January. Well, uh, I, have but, to, I have to restart my sled, get my reindeer ready. You know, there's absolutely. a lot of work to be done. You've got um, a lot of presents to deliver. So. Absolutely. I get a very big book and uh, I have to be honest, uh, this year I can still deliver in the UK also. So that's good. I'm, I'm very happy you know, uh, coming over from the North Pole without having a Brexit. So from that point of view, it's it's for all the children watching, um, you know, you're going to enjoy your Christmas. Yeah. For us, uh, yes, we're going to enjoy it with family, um, reminisce a little bit about the past and the future yeah. and look at a great new year. And I think we are back in the new year. Um, we are indeed early, sure. early January. And let's hope that 2021 is a damn sight better than 2020 because this is a year to forget. Yeah. Uh, I already forgot it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mike, I'll see Bye. you in the new year. Have a great Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and a happy new year. Merry Christmas to you, Mike. Cheerio. Cheerio. Cheerio.